My name is Beth Ferris. I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings and co-director of the Brookings LSE project on internal displacement. We're delighted to organize this panel together with Médecins Sans Frontières on negotiating humanitarian access, how far to compromise to deliver aid. The impetus for this program today came from the publication by MFF of their book that you probably saw as you came in called Humanitarian Negotiations Revealed, the MSF Experience. This book was published in part to commemorate MSF's 40th anniversary. But you know, a lot of organizations, when they publish something on their anniversary, do so to highlight the achievements and the accomplishments and the impact of the organization. But this book, it takes a much more self-critical perspective. And looking at the experiences of MSF over the years in terms of compromises that need to be made in order to deliver assistance. And so we thought that the book is kind of a starting point for a broader discussion of some of what are, can be considered as ethical issues related to decisions about how far to go, what compromises to make to ensure that people in need receive the assistance they, they deserve. The book looks at a diverse case, uh, set of case studies from Afghanistan to Yemen, Sri Lanka, Iraq, Gaza, Afghanistan, and so on. Um, and we've asked uh, a diverse group of people to comment from their own experiences about this issue of access, compromise, to what extent are humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, independence, which are always somewhat aspirational. But to what extent can those be, be compromised in order to um, make sure that the aid gets through? So we'll, we'll begin with uh, Michael Newman from um, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. And all of the panelists have uh, extensive bios that are included in your packets, and, and I won't repeat them. But he'll talk about some of MSF's experiences over the year in this question of access and, and compromise. We'll then turn to Bill Garverlink, who has a very distinguished career in a variety of settings, uh, both with the U.S. government and think tanks and others, who will make particular reference to his time in Eritrea and, of course, any other situations you would like to interject. We'll then turn to Marcus Geiser from um, ICRC, who has come to Washington from southern Afghanistan, certainly an area where compromise and working with a diverse set of actors is necessary in order to deliver needed assistance. And finally, we'll hear from Robbie Torbay, who is um, with um, International Medical Corps, who will talk about the tensions between the need to deliver life-saving assistance and principles of um, humanitarianism, with particular reference to the cases of Sierra Leone and Iraq. Each of our panelists is going to face the daunting challenge of speaking for only 10 to 12 minutes, covering a wide range of issues, but that will allow us time for questions and interactions with all of you. So thank you all very much for coming, and we'll turn the floor over now to Michael. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much all for being here. I won't say much about the, um, the book. Elizabeth mentioned it already a little bit. Um, it's on display. It will be, I think, available uh, for sale very soon in the, uh, in the US. It's the result of, uh, of about 18 months work and research about conditions in which MSF negotiates uh, its access to uh, not only to places of conflict, but also in a public, he public health uh, crisis. It's born from a desire to uh, evaluate the um, relevance of, of, of the uh, usual humanitarian principle that we claim as being so imperative to the work we do. I won't go into details in many of the case studies that are in the book. I will mention a few, in particular Afghanistan and uh, Somalia and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, in 2004, uh, five of our colleagues in Afghanistan were killed uh, in the Badris province. Um, the Taliban were not responsible for that murders, for those murders, but they claimed the responsibility. Uh, they explain and, um, that NGOs such as MSF uh, were serving U.S. interest, uh, and MSF took the decision to leave the country, saying that. Independent humanitarian action, which involved and armed aid workers going into areas of conflict to, pro to provide aid, has become impossible. A few weeks after, a scholar close to the Bush administration and wife of the then ambassador to the uh, 
of the US in Afghanistan stated in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that the principal champion by Doctors Without Borders is now part of our nostalgic past. It was at the time where Colin Powell was calling NGOs uh, force multipliers, and there was a strong feeling within MSF that it was becoming more and more difficult to operate in, um, in crisis situation. A number of NGOs actually made the Taliban's uh, arguments easier by affiliating themselves to the war effort to the struggle for democracy in Afghanistan. To MSF, we had made all efforts possible to try to distance itself from uh, the war. It looked a little absurd. And um, there was that feeling that the killings were somehow a mistake, uh, that it wasn't fair. Uh, and we remembered that a year before, and I think my Marcus will get back to that, a year before, the assassination of a delegate of the RCRC in Afghanistan had already proven that the principles were in no way a guarantee to access population uh, in war settings. In the years that followed the, those, uh, those killings, MSF experienced a number of difficulties and very tragic events. Uh, we got three volunteers killed in Somalia in 2008, one volunteer killed in Central African Republic in 07, expulsion in Darfur, uh, suspension of the work uh, in Niger. Um, we had to confront very uh, strong uh, authoritarian states who wanted to control our uh, actions in Sri Lanka, in Ethiopia, in Yemen. Uh, we had to, uh, let's say, suffer pressure over our public communication, again in Sri Lanka uh, and in Yemen. And with a bunch of other NGOs, if not the whole community, we tend to explain those difficulties by saying that um, the humanitarian space was shrinking. Um, to back up this analysis, we called on the... Um, uh, the blurring of the lines of the of the lines that was heightened after the um, the 9/11 and the um, the intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan, the development of uh, international criminal justice, um, the uh, reform of the UN, were put together as an umbrella explanation of the difficulties um, of that that were that NGOs were were facing. Um, and that's the starting point of the book. That's where we started thinking, well, I mean, we need to go back and explain those difficulties, maybe taking a different angle. There is no question that the usage of the uh, humanitarian rhetoric by belligerents had an impact on the work we do, um, that we encounter specific difficulties in settings where international forces are deployed. Uh, but their impact on net operations is pretty much arguable. I mean, looking at the volume, uh, like the, the evolution of the budget allocated to humanitarian assistance that, uh, that was multiplied by 10 in the space of 20 years between 88 and 2008, looking at the numbers of aid workers that are spread around the planet providing assistance, um, make little sense uh, if we if to, 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 um, to maintain the assertion that, that, there, that there would be such thing as a shrinking of humanitarian space. And also that would be uh, shockingly underplaying the difficulties that uh, the humanitarian actors encountered in the past, in the 80s in Afghanistan, uh, in Ethiopia, um, the uh, expulsion that we uh, had to uh, suffer from Western Sahara in the 80s, kidnapping of staff in Somalia in 87 show that difficulties are part of the work we do and uh, such trend of growing difficulties uh, can be seriously uh, challenged. So our assertion was that rather than calling on a, on a kind of abstract space, uh, our experience tells us that it's, it's the uh, power games, the interest uh, seeking that make humanitarian action possible. If MSF is able to work in uh, authoritarian states such as 
uh, Sri Lanka or Zimbabwe or even confronting health crisis in South Africa, uh, being able with a lot of difficulties, as you all were uh, well aware, in Somalia. Uh, it's not so much because we are truly humanitarian, uh, but it's because we are of interest to the political parties. We bring something to the table that is interesting to them. Because of the services we provide, medical care, in the instance of MSF, um, the expenses and the taxes um, that we pay, expenses we contribute, um, we'll be discussing the Somalia example if you want, and also our contribution to the positive or negative image of a belligerent. All those elements appear to be to us uh, the main reason why actually we are able by authorities to work in any given territory. And so this process requires constant negotiations uh, that result in compromises. And we thought that it would be interesting to examine uh, those compromises to see how far an organization who claimed to be guided by principle uh, would tolerate, would accommodate. So in 2009, after uh, five years, I mean five years after our colleagues were killed, MSF returned to Afghanistan and we launched programs in uh, Kabul, but not only, also in Elmond province, which is one of the most disputed area in the, in the, um, in the country. So what made that return possible? Uh, we argue that the evolution of the dynamics of the conflict played a huge role in that. Um, the way the powers, the Karzai government, the Taliban, could see an interest in having us working there is the main element that made our return um, possible. Um, we can make the supposition that if we were targeted in 2004, and if the Taliban claimed responsibility for that incident. It's because at the time they were only looking to spoil the peace. They were, they are, were having no interest of a governing population. Uh, and in a way, MSF personnel appeared to the insurgent more useful dead than alive. Um, and that changed for many reasons that you, you know and I, and I won't be coming back to in, in details. The ambitions of the Taliban changed and the context pretty much then enabled us to, uh, to re-establish the relevance of MSF's uh, services. Um, in 2008, at a time where the Taliban were then, you know, uh, much stronger, uh, they were looking for uh, enhanced legitimacy. I mean, they were looking for help in providing services, medical services, in the population that were, uh, that were living under the control, and MSF could offer them that. Um, and in a, a subtle change of situation, we became more useful to them uh, alive than dead. Um, and as much as we made ourselves available for the discussion, actually, I think that they made themselves available to discuss with them. And Marcus will probably also talk about that. But the RCRC has been a, a key player in that relation, renewed relationship between MSF and the, and the Taliban. What made that discussion possible was, of course, also the distance that MSF has established uh, between its own ambition of treating patients and saving lives uh, and those ambitions of the coalition, establishing a peace and a government. But this is only one element. Uh, and it's not because we simply became or would have become more neutral, super independent, dramatically more impartial that we were able to work and re-establish a presence in Afghanistan. There is much more to it than that. Um, it's pretty much the same approach that uh, enabled us to uh, intervene in Mogadishu in 2007 at the time where the Ethiopian government, uh, army was basically um, 
destroying all medical capability able to uh, accommodate um, in, in, in the, the opposition and the Islamic, uh, Islamic fighters. What we were able to identify converging interests between parties that were very strong enemies to each other, former warlords, uh, and uh, the, uh, the dismantled ICU uh, Islamist opposition that enabled to, uh, to uh, that enabled MSF to uh, to establish an hospital project. So identifying the, this logic of the actors is something that is paramount uh, to creating that space, rather than. Um, raising the flag of, of principles that are a useful guide, uh, but in no way key to any doors of, of, of significance. Um, saying that, I don't want to say that uh, identifying interest or converging interest is always, is always easy. I mean, there are instances where we cannot identify any of those, and the uh, Sri Lanka example is, is typical of the situation. Despite feeling that it had a, a pretty good reputation in Sri Lanka. MSF has faced the huge frustration to be absolutely unable to work after the conflict renewed in 2006. First, to provide care in the conflict, in the conflict areas because of the logic of total war that animated the, uh, the belligerents, the LTT and, and the Sri Lankan uh, government. But also after that, where um, MSF could never, was, was never in a position to escape uh, being either a tool of propaganda for the LTTE or an agent of the uh, government Pacific Asian policy. And in 2009, it found itself uh, to be nothing but health auxiliaries to uh, other regime in the Tamil displaced groups, uh, displaced camps, uh, maintaining a live population that were maintained behind barbed wires. Um, in that case, in retrospect, we feel that we completely lacked a diplomatic backup, civil society support, uh, that maybe there was nothing that could be done in Sri Lanka for reasons that we can discuss further later. But uh, we were doomed to accomplish a policy of lesser evil, uh, um, recalling that no media pressure uh, could have any effect over the regime and found ourselves in a very difficult situation that is still very highly debated internally in MSF. Uh, you know, with a lot of questions on whether we should have gone there working in these camps or just like leave the country and let these people uh, on their own. Um, this is definitely one of the most of the toughest choices that MSF had to make uh, over the past uh, the past few years. So to to um, to conclude, and maybe I'm fine actually, uh, the, the real issue about the shrinking space paradigm uh, is that it it frees humanitarian uh, actors from the responsibility of conquering and defending their. Um, their own sphere of activity. And I think that what we try to do in this book is to make sure that, well, argue that actors had the responsibility. They, they, they could not just victimize themselves, uh, that they have a role to play, a political role to play. Uh, just because there are no legitimate parameters to uh, humanitarian action that would be valid at all times and in all situations. Uh, there is a space for negotiations, power games. Um, and the, lessons, the, the lesson for us, the, one of the main lessons for us after we conclude the research uh, for the book was that the issue for MSF is not so much to distinguish itself within the humanitarian community and, and like do the, the police of words like, you know, saying you are humanitarian, you are not, we are the true humanitarian, only with the RCRC, the, all the rest are just a bunch of, I don't know what. What was important is to uh, think through uh, our capacity, ability to negotiate with actors 
political authorities. Uh, and those results of those negotiations being what could help us access population in needs. Uh, whatever the powers we're talking about. I mean, they could be states, non-states, uh, civil society actors, anyone. Uh, and because negotiation is not just a process by which you recognize that you talk to everyone, it's also a process by which you recognize you bring something to the table. And I think that was the second conclusion to the work, is that the political exploitation of it is not a misuse of its vocation, but it's the uh, principal conditions of its existence. And I think that it's an invitation for MSF and for the humanitarian community as a well whole to, to uh, re-interrogate or re-question the way it's been framing the debate around uh, politicization of it. Um, the issue for MSF is, is then not so much achieving total freedom of action, uh, like above and beyond politics, but being able to choose its alliance according to uh, its mission. And its mission is to save lives. Uh, with no allegiances to anyone and no concerns about loyalty. And that is the third conclusion for us. Uh, in this respect, MSF is going to be, it's going to keep being, I think, an unreliable and unfaithful partner. We still horizons or landmarks, uh, or reference points, saving as many lives as possible and making sure that uh, its assistance does not serve primarily uh, the tormentors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, those of you standing in the back, uh, there are seats up front if you'd like to be more comfortable. We'll turn now to Bill, and maybe you can talk about some of the difficulties in negotiating access in Eritrea and elsewhere. <laughs> Not elsewhere. I'm just going to focus on Eritrea. Okay. I'd, I'd like to talk about the Congo, but that's a little that would be too much for the next few minutes. But, but just to, to go back to Eritrea, I would like to focus on that for just a couple of minutes. It's not some place that comes to mind right off the bat, but it was has been one of the most difficult places for NGOs uh, to operate and for humanitarian operations to take place uh, from its very beginning in 19. Uh, 1991, I guess, when it separated from Ethiopia until the, the until, until today. My involvement with Eritrea is I did a lot of assessments there with the EPLF uh, in the 80s, and was the aid director there for a few years from 99 to 2001 during the war with Ethiopia. So, I, and that's the that's the period I'd like to focus on. And for those of you who don't know a whole lot about about Eritrea or haven't focused on it, I would just mentioned two or three things that, that kind of help characterize Eritrea and how it operates with the, the rest of the world. And as you know, they had an independence struggle for 30 years, from the 1960s till 1991. They had very little help from the outside. They remember that very clearly. They're so they have a big emphasis on self-reliance, and I think a mindset that has evolved from that war largely by themselves is you do it our way or you don't do it at all. And uh, they're a very uh, controlling uh, uh, government. Uh, if you look at Eritrea itself, it's a very fragile area. It's always bordering on a humanitarian crisis. Um, it uh, it's, depends on agriculture that's rain fed. Rain is very unreliable there, so they're always in, in a difficult situation. And then finally, there was a war with Ethiopia from 1998 to 2000 that had a dramatic impact on Eritrea. Uh, a lot of the fighting took place in central and southern Eritrea in their agricultural area, and it had a major impact, causing hundreds of thousands of displaced people um, and major problems for the Eritreans. And then throughout all of this, uh, to today, one of the ongoing problems is there's always been tensions between the government of Ethiopia, or Eritrea and the NGO community. So if we go back, and in, and in 1997, for example, those tensions became rather high and they threw all the NGOs out of the country. Uh, I got there in 1999 and began discussions with the Eritrean government about the return of NGOs. First of all, the discussions had to involve what an NGO was. They were not that familiar with NGOs, and during their, their rebel period, they, uh, they pretty much dominated the NGOs that worked there. So they, uh, 
We explain that the U.S. government funds NGOs, but the NGOs are not part of the United States government. They determine where they work and what they do with the government and host communities of the host country, and their decisions are largely based on assessment and on need, not on political decisions of the government. And we went on to suggest to them that to, to get the NGOs to return to Eritrea, uh, it might be useful to start with those handful of NGOs that worked with them in the 30-year struggle they had with the Mengistu regime. And that made sense to them. And that was uh, Norwegian Church Aid, I think Oxfam, there were a couple others, CRS, CARE, World Vision were involved during that period. And those are the first ones to return to, to uh, to Eritrea. So we were successful in our negotiations and in 2000 the NGOs were invited back in and this group started to return and began to to initiate projects. Now the tensions again resumed almost immediately. Uh, the Eritrean government was began telling the NGOs that came back where they were going to work, what they were going and what they were going to do and they had this funny sense is they did not like NGO assessments because they didn't believe in geo assessments, they thought they would be self-serving, and they quite often didn't agree with what the Eritrean government wanted to say publicly. So they were not fond of have NGOs uh, carrying out assessments in, the, in their country. But there was a really large need in Eritrea at the time in 99 and 2000. That's the time of the war. There were hundreds of thousands of displaced people. There was a drought going on, and they needed assistance um, in a very big way, and so they agreed, that's how they agreed to allow the NGOs back. They also wanted to approve every budget and wanted to approve everybody hired, and they wanted to control the travels of the NGOs, and we said no to that in concert with the NGO community. We had a lot of meetings with the government, and uh, some of the, the worst or most difficult provisions of their their agreements to allow the NGOs to operate in Eritrea were set aside at that point. So we were, we were making quite a bit of success and uh, just sort of in the relationship between the NGO community and, and the government, the United States for example, uh, the, the government has an important role to play to assist NGOs in their negotiations with governments and access uh, to the areas where they want to work. The government, the donor government, has a convening authority, which, which NGOs usually do not have, to be able to have meetings with the government and with other donor agencies. And it has the ability, working with the host government, to help create an enabling environment so that the NGOs can, in fact, operate. And that's pretty much what we did to get the NGOs back into the country and to set aside some of the more onerous provisions of the, the Eritrean government's view toward NGO operations. And so from about 2000 to 2004, about 30 to 40 NGOs returned to, to Eritrea and began operating in the central and western part of the country where the need was biggest and to some extent in the eastern part of the country as well. And uh, we thought we had, you know, kind of finally reached an agreement with the Eritreans so that this would be the, the NGOs would have a normal operating environment and uh, could continue on their way. Uh, then things changed in 2005. They, they instituted some rather harsh um, requirements for the NGOs. Each NGO, international NGO, had to deposit $2 million in a local bank. Uh, they would renew their applications yearly. They could not hire military age individuals, that's 18 to 50. Um, they had to pay tax on their uh, activities and their equipment and, and they could only have one ex expat per NGO. Um, and those were some of the basic uh, provisions that they laid out. We worked with the government and talked to them. We got a few of them set aside. We got a couple of them postponed. But eventually, um, they were all, uh, they insisted on all of them. And we had a lot of discussions with the NGOs about whether they would accept this or leave the country. Most of them that were there agreed to accept these, most of these provisions, and most of the NGOs did, because of the need. And, and uh, they were allowed to work still where they wanted to and in the sectors where they had established programs, and they thought they could put up with these sorts of, uh, of demands of the Eritrean government as long as they could continue uh, to do their work. And uh, the, the U.S. and the Italian government and the Danish government and a few others were very supportive of this. 
Uh, in July 2005, it got much more complicated for us. They threw AID out of the country. So we had to do everything long distance from, from Washington to be helpful. One of the things that had been very helpful in these early years is that the organization that worked with the NGOs for the government was the ERRC, the Eritrean Relief and Rehabilitation Commission. That was dismantled in 2005 as well. <coughs> and all these issues were turned over to the Ministry of Labor, which, uh, and the folks who ran the ministry had not a clue what an NGO was or did or had, or had even less interest in all of this. So it got much more difficult by, by the mid, um, by mid to latter 2005. And they also did a very pernicious thing as they had an NGO, a, cam, a public relations campaign in Eritrea uh, criticizing the NGOs and blaming them for all the problems in the country and sort of turning the general public, uh, uh, making them more hostile toward the NGO community. It was a very nasty campaign and they saw the the, and they would characterize NGOs as the agents of a new colonialism by, by the international community. And it was a very hostile environment. Um, I went back and forth from Washington a few times to meet with the Eritreans to try and work this sort of thing out, and it was not, not very successful. And here's where uh, donors are a very mixed blessing. One of the things that was going on at this time is uh, the war had concluded with Ethiopia. And there was a decision that the international community, the United Nations, would put together a border committee that would delineate the disputed areas uh, between Ethiopia and Eritrea and decide who would get the disputed property. <coughs> Both Ethiopia and Eritrea signed an agreement with the UN that they would abide by the uh, decision of this commission. The commission came down on the side of Eritrea. Uh, the Ethiopians rejected the decision. And the international community and, and the Eritreans, mind particularly the U.S., said nothing. And in fact, for all intents and purposes, sided with the Ethiopian. So uh, I think the, the most visible thing they could do without fully breaking relations was to throw USAID out of Eritrea. And I think some of that international um, baggage was attributed to the NGOs as well. And they were treated in a much harsher fashion, not just the U.S. NGOs, but Italian NGOs and, and others. So the changes in diplomatic relations ha do have sometimes unexpected consequences for humanitarian organizations and how they do business in the country. So I think at that moment in time, we were not particularly helpful uh, to the NGO community trying to operate um, in Eritrea. And so we were tossed out. Uh, several other governments were tossed out. It was, became very difficult for the NGOs to operate. Uh, the regulations that were instituted in 2005 became much more intense. Travel was restricted. Fuel that was allocated to NGOs was very much limited. And by 2008, there were about three or four NGOs left. And again, they continued to stay, and their judgment as we talked to them was that they could actually work in the, they were restricted to now to working only in three sectors as well, health, water, and sanitation. And the NGOs who remain were satisfied with that because those were the areas of greatest need at this time in, in Eritrea. But it's my understanding that by the end of 2011, even those NGOs had left. So the negotiations by governments and NGOs sometimes just don't work. And I'll stop there. What a cheery story. <laughs> My goodness. OK, we'll turn now to hear from the experience of ICRC, which has always had a kind of a unique perspective. Marcus? Yes. First of all, uh, I may give the we, we may give you the appearance that MSF and ICRC has uh, carefully choreographed these presentations. Because yes, of course, I will talk a little bit about Afghanistan. But we have not done that. Uh, back in October 2009, as uh, myself as head of mission ICRC in southern Afghanistan, I travelled to Tirinkot, the capital of the Uruzgan province in southern Afghanistan. Uh, the aim was to open an ICRC office there. Uh, Tirinkot has become a place full of emotions for the ICRC. It was on a trip from Kandahar to Tirinkot at, on the 27th of March 2003. One of our colleagues, Ricardo Mungia, was executed. The man who killed Ricardo had an ICRC prosthesis. 
the man uh, who actually gave the order also had an ICSC prosthesis. They knew the ICSC perfectly well. They decided to uh, separate him from his Afghan colleagues, uh, asked him, I mean, ordered him to go to a ditch, and that's where he was killed. Ricardo was the first foreign aid worker who was killed in Afghanistan since the attack by the US government in October 2009. His tragic death was in a way a turning point for the humanitarian community as a whole, but for the ICRC in particular. The message was clear, no one is immune to attack. We all know that since 2003, in many parts of the world, managing local threats directly emerging from the global polarization along the main front lines, the many front lines of the so-called global war against terror, has become a fact of life for humanitarian aid workers. The ICSC certainly agrees with Marie-Pierre Allier in her introduction in that particular book that we are also somehow discussing here. And when she states that in the post 9-11 era, denying the use of humanitarian rhetoric by conflict parties is a futile exercise. For the ICRC, soldiers as providers of aid is nothing contradictory. The 1907 Hague Regulations and the Fourth Con Geneva Conventions, 1949, ob ob obliged the occupying forces to deliver food uh, and medical supplies to the population. What, of course, is more ambivalent is the increased permanency of the military performing as aid organizations. In some of the battlefields of 9-11 wars, humanitarian aid efforts and national security have merged, according to some. Mark Duffield, a British author, I understand, labelled it as the new humanitarianism. It may be useful to remind here that this is not a debate that started after 9-11. After the merger of security policies and aid is reflected in the contemporary history of the international humanitarian law, which is an essential framework for humanitarian action. I refer here to Hugo Slim, leading scholar in humanitarian studies, when he states, quote, the military and political leaders prefer, prefer humanitarian values to be rigidly controlled to prevent them from becoming an excessive threat to the war effort. In fact, aid remains in injection in the political, social, economical environment. Aid affects society, economy and power, and vice versa. It is indeed futile to deny this. I think all of us in this room agree that the work of humanitarian aid workers is contradictory. In an environment ruled by humanity and violence, aid workers are supposed to uphold humanity, humanity and peace. Uh, David Reeves' comment in his, afterword, in, his, in his afterword in this publication that we discussed this afternoon, that humanitarian organizations providing assistance in conflict zones cannot be as absolutist as human rights organizations, serves as a helpful reminder that indeed humanitarian action is, according to Reef, based on negotiating compromises with the relevant actors. Navigating through those forks of compromises is a challenging task and indeed requires a kind of a compass. For the ICRC, four core principles are essential to define humanitarian action. Neutrality, yes, involves no taking part in military operations. And neutrality here is really an operational posture. Humanity stands for respect of human beings. Impartiality means assisting those most in need with no discrimination. And independence is the obvious operational predisposition to act along these principles. While these principles are relevant to the ICRC, they are different approaches. And uh, for the ICRC, is not to speak that our approach is the only one. Our approach is the Dunantist approach. There are others, the Wilsonian pragmatists, according to some, who advocate for liberal peace building, they are faith-based organizations, they are for-profit organizations, so-called contractors. For the ICRC, the do not -east principles of neutrality, humanity, and partiality and independence are not moral values. Again, they are, in a way, uh, uh, operational, operational principles. The ICRC action in the domain of health in southern Afghanistan serves me here as an example of what a humanitarian uh, action along these do not -east principles actually looks like. Following the killing of Ricardo in 2003, ICRC was in a state of shock. The ICRC basically closed down its operation. The institution questioned whether the principles of neutral, independent, impartial humanitarian action could actually be upheld in the era of 9-11 wars. Rather than abandon neutral stance, 
ICRC reached out to all sides of the conflicts. It reinforced networking, reaching out to all conflict parties. Uh, it started uh, networking, not only with Taliban outside prisons, but also inside prisons. There we have a comparative advantage because we do visit some of these individuals. Uh, we also focused, uh, the ICC focused on re-establishment family links to bring an added value to families whose members uh, were actually uh, currently held in prisons. What's more, the ICC revised its operation and put a particular focus on its very origin, providing and assisting wounded and sick. Let me talk very quickly a bit how this could be done. The transport on wounded, the transport on wounded and sick. The ICRC basically established a taxi network of locally based taxi drivers that would arrive to the ICRC uh, uh, delegation that you can see here on this slide. Uh, these are private cars operating as normal taxis when not transporting wounded. Uh, they would be given some money when they bring wounded and they would have to bring those wounded to clearly identified hospitals. There are of course plenty of challenges to run this program. Intimidation of drivers, physical protection of drivers when moving around, avoidance at checkpoints, arrests of individual drivers for short, sometimes even longer periods of time, uh, and sometimes the drivers themselves caused us problems. The assistance to facilitate transport of wounded and sick goes beyond than just this taxi program. Uh, the ICRC, uh, for example, in 2011 gave technical support to the Afghan Ministry of Public Health of Kandahar when they decided to purchase a good dozen or so new ambulances through the US SERP funding. The ICRC provided here technical training to the MOPH staff, which is part of our usual, the ICRC's usual support and training program uh, for the health authorities in Kandahar. Excuse me, I forgot to. Yes, this would be one of those ICRC taxis with the ICRC driver. They would uh, carry these uh, ICRC ID identification cards. They would actually help them to go through uh, checkpoints. ICRC has also other activities in the in, in the field of uh, in the field of health, where we assist medical structures. The ICRC, for the past almost 20 years now, has assisted the Mirwais Regional Hospital Kandahar, which has now become the the, 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 the referral hospital of, of, whole, of whole Afghanistan. It's a program where the ICRC gives technical support, where the ICRC also gives, uh, uh, gives, gives direct support in case of mass casualty influx. But also here the ICRC realized that assisting only the Afghan MOPH structures would not help because you also have, uh, you also have uh, areas in rural zones where there are no Afghan MOPH structures. For this reason, the ICRC uh, decided to put up so-called so first aid posts. This is one of those pictures. You see a clearly identified, uh, more or less identified civilian structure uh, where the ICRC gives assistance along the, along the, base, the baselines of, of the Afghan Minister of Public Health. The challenge is here, entry by armed actors creates the perception uh, and actually creates outright risks for health staff to, to be part of, of, of the conflict, yes. Threats of arrests and also outright arrests at times by various armed actors of, of our staff who actually work in these, who actually work in these, uh, in, in, in these structures. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, after this brief overview, and it was really very brief, let me come to, a, to the conclusion. Southern Afghanistan is a context where the ICRC and other humanitarian actors who operate, like MSF in Helmand, have faced some of the toughest challenges. When I read Xavier's, Combre's and Michel Hoffmann's contribution, Afghanistan regaining leverage, yes, I noticed that not for the first time there's a strong resemblance between those two organizations. The principles of neutral, independent and impartial humanitarian action have certainly helped the ICC to regain the humanitarian space after the killing of our colleague Ricardo in 2003. A slow process of confidence building and transparent dialogue with all the parties to the conflict has allowed ICC to regain this acceptance, tolerance, respect to carry out its mandate. That respect should never be taken for granted. I also agree here with David Reef in his half the world when he says that when playing the game of making compromises, changes must be expected. The current proliferation of armed actors 
through the creation of de facto militias in Afghanistan poses a challenge to aid organizations to, that seek acceptance and respect from armed carriers. What's more important, I think, or what's equally important is that a dialogue about these principles is not enough. It has to be paired, it has to be paired with a meaningful action so that people, be it beneficiaries, state authorities, non-state actors, or international military forces see that ICSC can make a difference. Building up respect through operational relevance is at the core of the matter when we discuss access and acceptance of humanitarian action. In the end, as humanitarians, we should not be only judged by, we should, only be, we should also be judged by our action on the ground and not just our declaration of principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Certainly lots of things to think about here. But before we open the floor for discussion, we'll hear from Robin. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, my colleagues covered uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, issues here when it comes to negotiations and compromise. I will talk briefly about our experience in Iraq, uh, and I'm not going to touch on Sierra Leone because of the time. Uh, International Medical Corps went to Iraq in 2003, in the early days in, of uh, 2003, and we didn't know what to expect. Uh, as most uh, organizations, they had no presence in Iraq. When we arrived uh, to southern Iraq in Nasiriyah, we arrived to a clinic, and that was my first uh, experience inside Iraq, negotiating uh, in Iraq. We arrived to a clinic in Nasiriyah, and at that time, Nasiriyah was still really uh, uh, a war territory. It hasn't fallen completely. And when we got to the clinics, there were some sheikhs, some imams in the clinics. And we, we arrived there with a lot of medicines and supplies, and the first thing that we noticed was that the sheikhs were all over the clinics, and you know, initially we thought that's great. You know, at least they're involved in helping the communities. And when we told them what we're all about and who we are, obviously, you know, the fact that we're a U.S.-based organization didn't help us help us too much at that time. But they immediately gave us conditions, saying, "Okay, great. You know what? Give us the medicines. Give us all the supplies. We will look after our own people." And we've never had to deal with a situation like this where we you know, gave all of our medicines to uh, non-medical personnel to start with. So we started negotiations with them to find out why they want to take the medicines. What is, it they, what is it that they're after? And they will just tell us, you know what, these are our people. We know how to look after them. We do not want any NGO to be here or any organization to be here. The, the word NGO was very uh, strange to them. And we want to care uh, to our people. So we told them, okay, we'll get back to them in a, in a day or so about our decision. So we went and discussed internally. And we came back and, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a heated debate. And we decided not to give them the medicines. Uh, and we got into a big argument with them. Why do you do not want to give us medicines? People are suffering. There, there are no medicines in the warehouses. And, you know, you look at the situation, you have people that are suffering, that are in need of medicines, but also at the same time, you need to look at the bigger picture in terms of if we give those uh, clerics the medicine, is it gonna be a repeat of Hezbollah or Hamas in terms of them taking the medicines and providing uh, for the people and uh, in a way getting all the people on their side and alienating any uh, international intervention or any NGO, even the government of Iraq that didn't exist at that time. That was in April 2003. And uh, we refused, and we walked away. Uh, it took us about a week negotiating with them. Eventually, they saw that we were not going to budge, and there was no other uh, NGO at that time in Nasiriya. They allowed us to operate in a couple of the clinics, but they did not give us access to the main hospital or some of the other clinics or hospitals where they kept it to themselves. And that was at the beginning of our you know, 10 years or eight years of negotiations in, in Iraq, where nothing happens without a negotiation and a compromise. You know, from, we established ourselves in, uh, in uh, Baghdad. And, you know, at that time, in 2003, the situation was still okay uh, before the bombing of uh, the UN and, and uh, the UN building. And uh, the security was still okay. And uh, there was no sectarian violence yet between the Sunnis and the Shia. You know, moving forward a few years, uh, Sadr City, uh, or at Thawra, it's an area of about 3 million Shia that was controlled by Al-Mahdi Army. Al-Mahdi Army, as you know, was, uh, was an army established by one of the clerics that is very close to Iran. And the Iraqi government decided that they want to take that area because it was causing a lot of instability and 
it was a major uh, cause of tension between the Sunnis and the Shia and the sectarian uh, violence there. So the Iraqi uh, army, with the support from the US, completely surrounded that area and started attacking. We tried to negotiate with the Iraqi government access to that area. They refused. And we're talking about three million people that are completely surrounded, no food, no water, no medicines, nothing. Uh, we spent about a week negotiating with them. They agreed, but they gave us a lot of conditions whereby we're not allowed to take any vehicles in. And we're talking about a very big area here. Uh, we're, not, we're not allowed uh, to take, uh, or we're not allowed to employ people from Sadr City. So we have to get people from outside of Sadr City and you know, make them walk on foot when bullets are flying everywhere into Sadr City. And uh, they have to search every single thing and they will dictate what it is that we can and we cannot take. They said medicines, okay. Water is okay. Food was not okay. Non-food items out of the question. I don't know if they thought that the non-food items might have dual purposes, but uh, uh, they would not allow us. After, after we negotiated with the Iraqi government and with the Iraqi army, now we had to negotiate with al-Mahdi army so they would allow us access into the population. It was the same negotiations. They said, no Sunnis, absolutely no Sunnis, and we weren't going to send any Sunnis into a Shia area at that time. And they said, uh, nobody that's supportive of uh, uh, the prime minister. No. You know, how can we tell who supports the prime minister or not? We're not going to go around screening everybody you know, and do a polling exercise to see who, who they're going to vote for. Uh, eventually, we, we reached an agreement after about two weeks, and uh, we acquired a very good nickname. We were called the wheelbarrow NGO because they would not allow us to take vehicles in, so we had to load all of our supplies on wheelbarrows. We had to buy about 600 wheelbarrows that did not even exist in Iraq. We had to get them from Kuwait and, and uh, Jordan and get medicines and, and uh, water on wheelbarrows. Uh, it, was, it was one of the most difficult situations because once we came back, once you know, uh, there was a ceasefire that took a while uh, to compromise, once we came back, the backlash about us working in uh, Sadr City was even bigger than you know, the negotiations just to go in. Coming back and trying to work in some of the areas, trying to work in Ramadi and Fallujah and, uh, and uh, uh, some of the Sunni dominated er uh, areas was impossible. We were not allowed to go in there. And at that time as well, you know, a year before and during that time, there was a lot of push to control some of the Sunni area. If you guys remember, there was Al Sahwa, which is the, uh, the Sunni uh, uh, tribal leaders in uh, Ramadi and Fallujah that were trying to take uh, back their uh, areas from from the Al-Qaeda, uh, and we could not negotiate access in there because we, were, we supported the Shia, because we worked in uh, Sadr City. And uh, at that time also we were seen as, you know, we're coming behind the US military and the Iraqi army to clean up the mess after them. So, you know, going back to what Michael said about being a force multiplier, we were perceived as force multiplier because you see the Marines come in, then you see IMC come in after them. Now, that goes back to the bigger picture that was asked. Is that the right thing to do? Do we want to be seen or perceived as a force multiplier? Or do we want to stick to our neutrality and impartiality in terms of service delivery as well as the perception? And you know, obviously all of these take a lot of discussions, but at the end of the day, we decided to go in after the Marines and to set up camps and provide medicines and provide uh, medical supplies. We could not go into the areas themselves. We had to stay outside as the military was uh, going in. And that definitely compromised our uh, acceptance. Now, as an, or, as an NGO, we were in the red zone in Baghdad, in the, you know, in the civilian area. We were not in the green zone. We had absolutely no protection <coughs> from any, any side, the military or the police. Uh, and uh, we suffered a lot in terms of access, in terms of acceptance. Everything that we've done in terms of our work from 2003 to 2008, within two months of work in, in Sutter City, and then afterwards in, uh, in the Ramadi area, all of that was compromised within two or three months of action. Now, you know, was it the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? You know, I, I personally believe because I made the decision, I personally believe it was the right thing to do. I'm not going to say uh, I, did, I made a wrong decision. But you know, at the end of the day, it is, it's, it's what we're all about. We're, we're there to help people and you have to weigh the pros and cons. You know, do you do more damage by sitting back or do you do more damage by actually getting involved and helping people? 
As an organization, our mission is similar to MSF's mission, which is saving lives, but also building capacity. We're there for the long run. We're there for the development phase as well. And we, keep, we focus quite a bit on the idea of saving lives. You know, we do what it takes to get in there and set up the clinics and, and, and hospitals and uh, try to save as many lives as possible. Uh, we have the tendency to keep very quiet in terms of no press releases, no communications, no advocacy. And we get a lot of flack from not being an advocacy-oriented organization, you know, be it in Sudan and Darfur or Iraq or Afghanistan. And uh, you know, in a way, we, sometimes we see a lot of things that we should be talking about. But we compromise that in order for us to stay and be, uh, being able to uh, serve our people. Uh, is this the right thing to do? I don't know. Every organization is different. But that's, that's how we go about uh, doing it. And uh, it's not just Iraq. You know, if you look at uh, Darfur, it's the same thing. Many organizations <laughs> were asked to leave. We're one of the few well, that, that wasn't asked to leave uh, uh, Darfur. Uh, by us saying, do we support uh, the Sudanese government in terms of what they're doing? Uh, I don't believe so. But we had 230,000 people that we were caring for, and we were the only health provider for 230,000 people. And we were not going to walk away just to be loud and talk or witness something uh, or talk about something that we witnessed. There are many ways to get that information out without us uh, talking about it. So, you know, when, when you hear, when you listen to all four, uh, four of us, we all come from a different perspective. We all have uh, a different way of doing things. But at the end of the day, we're unified by one mission, which is really trying to negotiate in order to help people, and there's no right or wrong. Uh, after being in the NGO world for too many years, I'm not going to say how much because you know my age, uh, but after being in the NGO world for too many years, uh, I don't believe there's any uh, right or wrong. There's always a right approach for any specific situation or a wrong approach for any specific situation. And if there's anything that you, know, you should leave with is that approach needs to be dictated, not by something that's written on a paper that was written 20 years ago on your mission statement, but based on what you see on the ground and how you react to what you see on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think all four of you have raised a number of important issues about how far you negotiate that access. I remember one of my first humanitarian experiences was in Somalia in the early 1990s, where NGOs and others agonized over, do you hire technicals? armed guards to keep your staff safe, even when by doing so you're putting money and actually prolonging the conflict. I mean, aid sometimes is not neutral. It is an economic resource in, in, a, in, in a lot of these situations. But we'll open it up now and hear your questions. You can direct them to any individual or just toss out general ideas. And if it's OK, we'll take three or four and then I give you all a chance to respond. We have a microphone. and. Yes, please, in the very back there. And if you could introduce yourself. Sure. My name is George Lyle. And a uh, question for anybody who wants to answer. So the typical NGO's job is to alleviate suffering. Whose job is it to keep it from happening again or to keep it from happening in the first place? OK, that's an easy question, yes. Next question. <laughs> OK. Uh, Nabil al takridi University of Mary Washington, and MSF as well. Um, the focus of the book is primarily field-oriented, and the focus of the panel has also been primarily field-oriented. In other words, how do you negotiate humanitarian <coughs> access over there, wherever over there is? Um, but I'd like to turn it on its head a little bit and ask uh, the panel, since we're here at this near the center of the beast, uh, namely Washington, um, that's a bit of a joke, but is there something that um, the U.S. government could consider doing to help um, NGOs attain access globally? Because some of the reasons that limit humanitarian access are also because of policies that are driven in D.C., namely the, the comment of the force multipliers. One example, the argument of humanitarian intervention uh, to engage in conflict is another example. Um, some issues with trade and access to drugs is a third example. So just, it's an open-ended question. Is there something that Washington could change that could open up access in the field? We'll have this woman right here. 
Kagan and the Charity and Security Network, I would add to the list of uh, the gentleman on my right, the, uh, the anti-terrorism laws and the sanctions that forbid transactions and may forbid negotiations or counted as material support of terrorism. Okay, why don't we start with those three questions. The first is the tension between addressing the causes, stopping the violence, and alleviating suffering. What can the U.S. do to help secure access globally? And third, more specifically, the impact of the anti-terrorism sanctions on humanitarian action. Who'd like to start? Well, okay, I, 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 <laughs> those were no I, easy I questions. Start. <laughs> I'll start with the, uh, with the second and third one. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, global message to the U.S. government, uh, or any government for that sake. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there is no question that those comments by uh, Colin Powell or, or Condi Rice's comments that uh, the tsunami was a wonderful opportunity to show the, you know, the, the generosity of the American people, for instance, or uh, the, the, the anti, I mean, the criminalization of it and the anti-terrorist regulation uh, don't help NGOs uh, in, in, in securing access. Um, we, we at, at MSF, being uh, privately funded, are uh, mo mo most, I mean, the huge majority of the funding comes from private donors help us uh, navigate through those constraints. Um, but uh, I think there is a few things that we cannot ask the government. I think we cannot ask the governments, or the US government, to stop uh, being politicians uh, or in drawing policies. Uh, this is the job. This is what they do. Uh, if the uh, US government uh, wants to uh, integrate assistance in their portfolio of activities, it will be very difficult for us uh, to denounce that, provided that, as Marcus explained, I mean, there are provisions that clearly establish a responsibility of governments to do so. Uh, I think there is a lot that, uh, that, that, that uh, <laughs> A lot, a, a lot lies on the shoulders of the humanitarian actors themselves to define their own policy of humanitarian action, uh, separate from what the U.S. wants to do, uh, separate from regulations, and, and I think that's that's you know a, a very important uh, <coughs> message that I think we want to um, to get across. The uh, anti-terrorist regulation is something different. Um, I think they are, uh, they may be, and I think the debate is pretty open, uh, they are, they may be real serious consequences on individuals who work in Gaza, in Somalia, uh, in Pakistan, in places where they are de facto in contact with individuals or group considered as terrorists. And this is something that will need pro a very strict clarification from the, either the political authorities or the legal system. Uh, and we have not been seriously yet confronted to, uh, to that, but I think this is something very serious. And, um, and there may be, like here on that particular subject, venue of collaboration between different NGOs, uh, including MSF. Um, then on the first question, um, NGOs actually, I mean, some NGOs may very well decide to work in the field of, uh, of not only alleviate suffering, but also work for peace and, 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 and development and, and conflict prevention. I mean, some do so. Uh, but by doing so, uh, they, they condemn themselves not to uh, be able to operate in certain areas. And I think that's where the core issue is. I think that when uh, groups take the decision in conscious to work, uh, to follow the Marines uh, in Iraq, or to 
to uh, <coughs> subscribe to the agenda of, 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 of state, state building in, in, in Afghanistan, they take a risk. They take a risk of being unable to work should the consequence, uh, should the, the situation evolve. I mean, by picking the, the, the by basically betting that the, vic the, the victor would be the, uh, the US-led coalition in Afghanistan, a lot of NGOs uh, created the difficulties that they face today to operate in, uh, in Taliban-controlled areas. I think that that's that the, the core issue here. I, I, by sticking to a, a mandate or a, a social mission that is, uh, in the case of MSF, uh, saving life, or it could be building schools, or, um, I think we prevent ourselves of being um, um, uh, well, of, of, of not being able to pursue our mission. Uh, and I think that's, that's what is important. Any other comments? Bill, you want to jump in and then Ronnie? Sure, I'm, I guess being the government person here, well, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I'll comment on a couple of things. What can the U.S. do to, to open access worldwide? I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I've worked for the U.S. government for 30 years for all kinds of Republicans, Democrats, all different administrations on humanitarian issues. And there's a major commitment of this government to provide humanitarian assistance worldwide and to support humanitarian organizations. I'm not sure what the U.S. government can do beyond that. Most of my career is in an organization called the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. We have been, when I was there, uh, I'd never had an instance where we could not provide assistance to a particular group or a particular country. The, the rest of the U.S. government did not say, you can't do that, they're not our allies or they're not our friends. Never came up. We could go any place we wanted to and assist any population we wanted to. <clears throat> I think the United States has a, an enormous commitment to providing humanitarian assistance worldwide, and, and I'm not sure. I think that's fairly well known. It's one of the planks of the foreign policy of every Secretary of State and every president, if you go back about as, at least as long as I've been doing this business. So I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that the United States puts a very high priority on providing uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, <clears throat> promoting humanitarian access and humanitarian space. I'm not sure I believe there is such a thing as humanitarian space. To me, uh, IMC has to negotiate its humanitarian space. There isn't any. That's, <clears throat> that's an intangible thing. Just like, unfortunately, right now, I don't. You know, the, the, we talk a lot about these principles, and I guess I'll, I'll state my views from from where I've been in this business. I think neutrality and independence have long gone. There is no such thing as, as that. If you're a U.S. organization, you're stuck with U.S. baggage. If you work in a, a Muslim country and you're suspect, you're never neutral. You cannot be neutral. You may think yourself neutral, but the people you're working with don't and you miss that at your peril. I think, hopefully, everybody can provide assistance impartially so that it goes to the people who need it as opposed to those who don't. I think uh, the U.S. government does that quite well within the context of U.S. foreign policy, and I think every NGO does that similarly within the context of their mandate and their operating procedures. But if people really think they're neutral, I don't care. I'm, or, there is no such thing as neutrality. Not in the world today. It's a nice thing to hope for, but I don't think it really exists. And I think you take, take your life in your hands where we work these days if you believe that. Uh, the, the next question, the anti-terrorism laws. I'm looking right now where I'm sitting a lot at Somalia. Um, I don't think the U.S. is ever going to get rid of those anti-terrorism laws. But it's interesting when you get a group of people together and talk about them, Everybody's so confused they can't figure out who's on first to understand the, the, the laws from the Treasury Department, which is OFAC, and the Patriot Act. And I think it's incumbent upon the U.S. government to clarify those things so everybody understands exactly what they mean. And to my sense, they haven't done that yet. Great. Abby? Bill covered almost uh, everything. Thanks uh, for taking the government uh, question as well. That was a hot one. On, on, <laughs> on the terrorism and the no contact, have you ever tried to negotiate with someone you can't talk to? Just imagine, this is the situation that we're facing in a place like Gaza, where we have a no-contact policy. We cannot sit down and negotiate with Hamas or talk to them. So obviously we have to do it through a third party, mainly the UN. Uh, we talk to the UN, the UN 
uh, talks to, to Hamas so we could implement our program. We cannot hire any of their staff. We cannot invite them for training. So it's extremely difficult. But it's feasible. It's possible. But it takes a lot of effort. It takes, uh, you know, it takes a longer time to achieve something that you could achieve in half an hour over the phone. It might take you a week or two, especially if you rely on, on, on the UN because you know they're extremely fast uh, in getting things done. <laughs> Any UN personnel here? Probably. <laughs> uh, on They'll let you know. <laughs> here goes our funding. Uh, <laughs> on, on the first question, in terms of whose responsibility is to, uh, to, uh, to prevent suffering, uh, this, is, this is, you know, it's everybody's job. It's the government's job. It's the host government job. It's the NGOs. It's the media. It's the brookings of the world. I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think there's any single body that's responsible for this. Uh, and I think all of them need to work together much better in order to actually start preventing some of the suffering that's taking place. Uh, I, this is, this is uh, you know, too big of a question for me to answer. Uh, I don't think anyone's got the perfect answer for this one. Marcus, do you have the perfect answer? Uh, in regards to second, the second question, very quickly, uh, I think what's important is that a government should always accept uh, an organization's mandate, and uh, in regard, I can only talk in the name of the ICC in regards to our relationship with the US government. Yes, we, we do have talks about acceptance of our mandate, and uh, I think that's important. Yes, there's this dialogue, and that's, that's, that does not only count for the ICC, but in general, I think. Uh, no, humanitarian aid organization is not a political actor, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, where, where, else can they, where else can they help uh, humanitarian actors success? Well, yes, indeed, we, as, as a donor, yes, and I think it's still recognized that the US government is a key donor to many humanitarian aid organizations, including the ICLC. In regards to the anti-terrorist regulation, here it goes back a little bit to what I've just said about the acceptance of, of one's mandate. The, the ICC has this mandate. Uh, given by the Geneva Convention signed by, by the states. And so we, we do indeed have a kind of an obligation to talk a little bit to everybody, yes, uh, non-state actors or eight, uh, state actors, also there's, a, there's an understanding for that. And as an ICLC delegate, of course, I also then have to make sure that when we operate in certain areas where indeed this regulation gets a bit tricky, Somalia, for example, that we have to explain to our donors very well how we use their money and how we, how we operate in certain areas to make sure that indeed the assistance goes to the right, to the right people. This is the, the professional attitude <coughs> of, a, of, a, of, a, of a humanitarian aid organization. Question one, yes, I think all has been said. It's the, it's the responsibility of all of us in this room, yes. And, and how do you react to Bill's comment that the days of neutrality are over, if, if they ever existed? Is it possible to be neutral in these situations? Asking ICRC. Uh, again, for us, neutrality is an operational posture. For us, neutrality is not to get involved in politics. Uh, in, from, if you look at it, neutrality from that particular point of view, uh, it, is, it is absolutely possible, yes, I would say so, yes. And I think it's an important uh, it's, it's, it's a <coughs> principle. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's, it's, it's less difficult, but at least we should strive for that, yes. Uh, again, we look at it really as an operational posture, not as a moral value. Uh, uh, it's an operational posture that actually helps us to deliver, and I think there we agreed on impartiality to indeed give aid to those in need. Neutrality is indeed a way to reach people, yes. If I could just add, I think if there's one organization that, that can do that, it is ICRC. ICRC. Right. See, we have another round of questions. I have, oh, a lot now. We'll take these two young women here. Oh. If you could stand up and introduce yourself. Rachel Oswald, I'm a journalist. Uh, Playing devil's advocate, this isn't necessarily something I agree with, but it did just strike me. Um, if the operational mandate is to provide um, medical care, why not then just give the medicines to Hezbollah and allow them to give them to the people and allow Hezbollah to enjoy you know, the um, boost in public popularity if the operational mandate really is you know, provide medical care? OK, good. Next question. Hi, my name is Jennifer Altal. I'm mostly recently a co-tar on a uh, USAID Afghanistan stabilization program. Um, my question is regarding uh, managing perceptions, and each of you has spoken a bit to this, um, and your broader, broader strategy formation. I know that many humanitarian aid NGOs, um, such as yourselves, operate on the principle of um, you know, relying on your locals, uh, your local friends, your local drivers, as your security, as your protectors. Um, and as we've seen in Afghanistan, 
no matter how neutral you can be in your operating mission or how well you can have relationships with local actors, at the end of the day, there is this much stronger, in many cases, perception that you are affiliated with the US government, you are affiliated with other US or international forces, um, particularly with the contract mechanisms that we often have in place as opposed to grants. Um, so I would just ask you both on a sort of operational individual organizational perspective, but also broader for the entire humanitarian aid industry, what can our strategies be to manage this? Because at the end of the day, you can't ignore it, such as what Bill has just stated earlier. Um, but yet at the same time, we're still relying on those sort of older ways of operating to survive, um, literally. So thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have the gentleman right back here and then right in the back. Hello, my name is Orion Marlow. I have a question to basically the aid organizations here. Um, what would interest me is um, by what criteria you determine the countries you offer your services in and um, if it's maybe not better to use a utilitarian approach of just saying, well, we'll offer our services in the countries that are showing themselves more cooperative and thereby um, helping actually the greater number of the people. In the back. Hi, I'm Brian Jolkowski from Mercy Corps. Um, and this is a question for Michael and I guess MSF. Building a little bit on the second question, I'm curious in your re-examination re of the humanitarian principles and how they relate to your operations and negotiating access. Um, if it's caused you to re-examine your security models, and in particular in, in relation to, say, armed security in certain environments or in certain environments where certain parties like governments might require armed escorts and that kind of thing. So how far has that examination um, followed through into kind of security operations as well? Great. Are there other questions right now? <clears throat> we'll have right here. Thanks, Margaret McKelvey from the State okay. Department, Refugee Programs. Um, I think we're, hopefully you're speaking to a fairly um, tuned in audience on all of this. And I'm wondering, it's a lot of nuanced presentations. If we're dealing with um, sort of the public at large that we're looking to for support for activities and that kind of thing, is there any way to simplify the message <laughs> of your book that's, um, that can just resonate with someone that doesn't deal with all of the nuances one way or another. Thank you very Maybe much. Maybe a little more than a yes, no on that. <laughs> okay, let's have some responses. You wanna start, Michael? Okay. I'll be, I'll be quick and I may pick and choose the questions that I'm going to answer mm -hmm. so that I not talk for 10 minutes. Um, why not give the money to Hezbollah or, or anyone else? Um, well, I think we're not a donor, so that's not what we do. Uh, that's the simplest answer I can give. I think there are some guarantees that should go with uh, with what we are, you know, and why people give their money to us and don't give it to Hezbollah directly, because they could do that then also. Uh, they want, and we want to make sure, to make as sure as possible that the right people get the right treatment. Uh, we want to emphasize the quality of the care we provide. Uh, and, and this is something that we, we want to do directly and being able to do it directly. We want also to be put in a position where we can also, if, if it makes sense, if it serves the purpose, uh, to report what's going on in any given situation. Okay, so I think it, it, it does make sense as a service provider and not a money provider uh, to, to do that. Although there is a lot of discussion in, about like, the role of cash distribution and, and why not unlink cash, and that's another topic of discussion, but you know, it probably connects a little bit to, to your, to your um, question. Um, then, how to manage perception and, and you know, relating to a question about security. Uh, I think there is, there is a, uh, the image is important. Uh, the image is a condition. Uh, so we need to work on image. Uh, you know, there is, there's been a lot of discussion about like, uh, how much the origin of funding affects perception. I think, for instance, there is too much weight on that. I think that, uh, you know, in coming from MSF, that's a little bizarre, but I think that um, 
most people actually don't really care where the money comes from. What's really important it is the service that is provided. Okay? Uh, RCRC is funded by all governments. Uh, there are some other operations. It's heavily funded by the US government. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I think that does not affect per se their operation or ours if it would be the case. Um, I think that the perception is heavily linked to the quality of the, of the operations you, um, you make. Uh, quality for the population and quality relating to interest for, uh, for the political powers and authorities in your working environment. Now, uh, as our work led to a reflection on, on security management, and not directly, uh, the book is serving a lot of purposes internally in terms of uh, uh, making, trying to guarantee that there is space for discussion about this topic in the organization uh, to make sure that uh, this emphasis on, 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 on compromises, like the, the political aspect of the work uh, is is kept in people's mind in the field. That they know how to confront the authorities better. I think this, this is the first objective of the, of the book. Um, we talk a lot about Somalia in the book. Uh, I, I wrote that chapter. And, uh, and Somalia is one of the very, very few places where we've been using armed guards for, I mean, since the early 90s, uh, for no other reason that there is absolutely no choice. Everybody does it. If you don't, you're dead. Um, sadly enough, even if you do, um, you may be killed, as showed recently uh, by you know the uh, tragic incident uh, in Mogadishu that affected MSF Belgium. So I think that this uh, look at uh, the usage of armed guards is going to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis always, at least as it has been. I mean, Somalia is the today ex exception, but we used to use armed guards in Afghanistan and Eritrea. Uh, when working from, Bur from Thailand into Burma, we were not using armed guards per se, but were definitely being escorted by the guerrilla members, uh, the Karen, be, be they the Karen or the Kashin or, or all these groups. Um, so there is no dogma about the uh, no use of armed escorts. There is a most preferred approach that can be bridged uh, if you know, we feel that the conditions are, if, are imposed, impose that choice uh, on us. And maybe the, the last question by Margaret uh, about the, um, how to, well, I mean, th this book was primarily uh, written, uh, let's say, or was born, as I said, um, from internal discussion. And we want the book to be really used internally, uh, first in MSF, also for the, let's say, humanitarian community, so that maybe they realize that there's a little more to the reality that usually is passed to the public. Uh, and I think it's important for an organization that to, to show that it, it is self-conscious of the choices it makes. And, for the, and that's the message that we want to provide the public with. We don't expect the public, I think, to understand all the nitty-gritty, all those negotiations and processes. I think it's, it's uh, for transparency's sake that we say, look, I mean, uh, the, the, this NGO you are actually giving money to is not that filled with moral pure, purity that you, that you think. Uh, we, are, we are shaking hands with the devil. You should know it. And that's how we are trying to make sure that your money is best utilized. And we are very well aware that there are instances where there are doubts, and there is diversion, and there is taxation, and a few and little money can, can go and, and, yes, fuel the war. Does it mean that uh, we contribute usually to conflict? The answer is no. This is obviously, evidently, extremely marginal, but it serves no purpose to deny uh, what's obvious to all of us here. And I think that's you know, maybe the one message that we try to um, 
to explain uh, to the public. Okay, we're, we're running short on time, so I'd ask the other three panelists to respond briefly and any closing remarks you'd like to make. Uh, just to respond, since I brought up the Hezbollah thing, I will start with this one. Uh, there, there are many reasons why we can't and we shouldn't. First of all, we need to look at the bigger picture. If you go back to the early 90s in Somalia, where aid was used as a weapon of war by certain militias, we need to be careful not to fall into that and suddenly the good intention ends up actually harming uh, people rather than uh, assisting, so that's one thing. Accountability is a big thing. Our donors trust us with the money that we buy the medicines with. We need to make sure that it does get to the right people. It doesn't end up in somebody's pharmacy being sold on the street. So those are two, two things. Uh, you know, again, uh, in addition to the fact that groups like uh, you know, uh, Hezbollah and, and, and Hamas are groups that we're not even allowed to deal with. But I, I think just being careful that our aid doesn't become a weapon of war and accountability are really big. Um, the criteria for intervention, somebody asked uh, about the criteria for intervention. And why don't we support a government that's doing okay because it will have uh, more impact? Our, our uh, criteria for intervention is based on needs. And usually if, gov if a government is doing okay, the needs are less. So there's needs, there's impact. Are we gonna have any impact or are we wasting our, our time and money? Uh, there's access. Do we have access to that population? Are we going to do more harm than good if we access them? And that's something that we cannot deny, although you know, we tend not to talk about it. Funding. Is there funding to, to do any work? Uh, you know, if there's no funding, you go in there and saying, we will be helping this population, but you don't have any money to help. Well, you're pushing away somebody that actually might have the money to help. So this is the way we look at it. Um, I, think, I think simplifying the message, I think uh, that was handled pretty well, uh, uh, Margaret. Um, you know, uh, the assessing the situation, determining the needs, uh, looking at the greater good, and obviously looking, uh, looking at the do no harm, uh, you know, that we do not cause harm when, when we do an intervention. And, and really, uh, you know, I wouldn't say reinventing the wheel every time, but sometimes you go into a situation, you just have to improvise and see what's the best approach to any specific situation, rather than the cookie cutter approach that, you know, that's written in, uh, in our policies that were written 50 years ago. Bill, and Just a know. couple of quick comments. One of the, going back to, to managing perceptions, which I, <clears throat> I think in the world today in the humanitarian business is a really important, important factor. And, and I think we have our own perceptions of what we're like uh, with our organizations and government when we go into an area. But when, when any of us as an organization go in with dollar resources into a resource poor area, it becomes political very, very fast. And whether we like it or not, it's going to be. And we've seen that in every humanitarian in, uh, in situation I've ever been involved in. So we have to be very careful about how we act and, and how we use our resources because we are perceived very differently by the folks on the ground than the folks sitting in this room. And uh, your comment about uh, depending on local staff for security and that sort of thing, I've, frankly, I have had too many friends who did that and they're not living anymore. <clears throat> it's very important not to put local staff in that sort of position. If, if, if they can be pressured very easily and threaten themselves uh, if someone has an interest at, at getting at uh, some humanitarian workers, and it's very wrong to put the local staff in, 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 a, in the position of either defending his or her family or defending the place he or she works. That's, that's just not appropriate. On criteria, at least from a donor government, from my experience, when we're providing humanitarian assistance around the world, there are a number of factors that always came into be. As one is the need, as, as has been said, the second is access, the third is what other people are doing, what other donors and other agencies are doing there, and if assistance from us will help or it's not necessary. And then the capabilities and the commitment of the, of the local government. If there is no interest, like Eritrea, it's really tough to justify putting resources there where you could go to, go to another country which would be very uh, supportive of your initiative. So those kind of factors all work into the decision. In regards to managing perception, uh, uh, to all what has been said, I would like to add that an organization that works in a conflict zone has to be predictable and transparent. That is very important, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, as we are engaging with indeed actors who do not know us, uh, as it has just been said, for example, the ICRC's engagement with uh, actors 
from the from the Islamic world. I mean, spiritual actors, uh, actors who, who, who sorry, uh, not spiritual actors, uh, specialists in Islamic law. Yes, of course, you have to then uh, you have to engage with these people because uh, they do have a lot of uh, uh, perceptions and misperceptions and maybe misperceptions that we also will never be able to to uh, get out of the air. But I think engagement is very important and transparency and predictability to do exactly that is, is, is certainly needed. In regards to criteria, yes, I think the, uh, uh, any humanitarian action has to be condition-based, yes. I think conditions-based means you have to go to the field and see the realities with your own ground. Even if someone tells you in a capital that the situation is, is okay, maybe I misunderstood that question. I apologize for that, yes. In regards to the first one, Hezbollah, well, yes, I thought it was also providing aid to Hezbollah. It was only providing money to Hezbollah. Yes, I agree with my colleague. Uh, providing aid and money is slightly different, yes. Okay, well, thanks to all four of the panelists, and please join me in thanking them. <laughs>